you can get really involved with all the processes that's happening on the on the uh, individual microbe level and the cellular level and all the biochemistry that's involved in this compost making thing but you really don't have to which is a very good thing because you don't have to know anything technically what's happening you don't even have to know that it's you need a 20 to 1 C to N ratio I did not for probably half the 20 years that we've been making compost. I just was fiddling around with the right combination and the right steps and through trial and error we kind of discovered for our situation on our farm the right mixtures to put the straw and the manure together and adding water and things like that. So the whole point is you don't have to be a rocket scientist. It's not rocket science making compost. It's just getting the right steps in the right time periods and then more importantly even is what to do with things don't go right. Anybody can make compost. Uh, technically you, you want to have about a 20 to 1 ratio of carbon to nitrogen and uh, the sheep think a little different. But, uh, so what it all it is is you got carbon, you got nitrogen, you got water, and you got air. Those are the four things that you need for compost, and it's the correct uh. mixture of all of those that that encourages the bacteria in the pile uh. to grow and multiply and create heat and eat all of your carbon up, so you get a nice finished product. So over here on this part, this part of the pile here is. All the straw that we cleaned out of the lambing barn in back of us, uh, there's quite a bit of straw that we use during lambing. And this part over here, <laughs> this pile is all the manure that we scrape off the feeding slabs during uh, the lambing season, which is about a month and a half. And so we have two piles here one straw which is your carbon source and the other is your manure which is your nitrogen, nitrogen source and what we're doing is we're taking the carbon and we're combining it with the nitrogen we're mixing it all up we have about 60 percent uh, dry matter or our correct amount of moisture here and when we put it through the manure spreader, we're adding air and we're also mixing. So that is the whole process of composting as far as the mixing goes. And I just want to reiterate that you don't have to be, you don't really even have to know what your C to N ratio is. You don't have to know what's going on there with what species of bacteria you have. All you really got to know on the farm is how to mix it how to pile it in the windrow, and what to do if things don't go right. Go for it. Let's visit about mixing your feedstocks and putting them in a windrow. For our sheep operation, we combine six scoops of straw bedding with four scoops of manure. The exact combination of straw and manure may vary depending on the amount of urine and manure in the bedding and also upon the species of animals that the manure came from. Sheep have about one and a half to two times as much in in their manure as do dairy and beef cows. At any rate, a good starting point for your mix is one and a half scoops of straw to one scoop of manure. We layer the straw and the manure in a spreader like this. Four scoops of straw, two scoops of manure, two scoops of straw, two scoops of manure. With our skid steer loader, this equals about six cubic yards. Next, we back up into the windrow and leave about five feet of space into which the load is windrowed. Note how the straw gives structure to the windrow. This is how you want it to look. When the windrow meets the end of the spreader, we move the spreader forward five feet and continue windrowing the mixed feedstock. With a correctly mixed feedstock, this should give you about a five foot high windrow, 12 feet wide. Now let's look at the most common error made in mixing feedstocks. Too much manure. 
Believe me, I've made this goof up many times. It's easy to do. Livestock farms, particularly those grazing or lot, dry lot operations, often generate more manure than bedding. You want to get rid of this stuff. However, to make good compost, you have to feed the micros, and they need a lot more carbon than N to prosper. Here we are building a windrow that has four scoops of straw to two scoops of manure. Note that this is exactly the opposite of what we want. Check out how much more manure there is than in this correctly mixed windrow of six scoops of straw to four scoops of manure. Look at the overall height between the two windrows. The correctly mixed windrow is about 57 inches tall. Note the slump in the incorrectly mixed windrow. It is only 43 inches in height. There are other differences as well. Here we have two grab samples. Look at the differences between the two in this clean hand squeeze test. With a little bit of practice, you will be able to distinguish the difference between a correctly mixed windrow and one that is not. Mixing the feedstocks sets the stage for successful compost. This is how the compost looks right after you turn it for the first time. You'll notice that it's roughly about two-thirds fiber or carbon. It's the straw that we mixed in with the manure and then about one-third manure. And that's basically what you want to have. Uh, if you have too much manure, after a, oh, two or three turnings, it stalls out on you because there's not enough carbon for the bacteria to uh, exist on. If you have too much straw or carbon, the same thing happens. They don't have enough protein to, to exist on. So it's pretty important to, to get your right mix as you mix on your first windrow. Otherwise, you're going to have to add straw or manure as you go, and that's, that's pretty time consuming. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is how it's supposed to look like as you turn it and this is basically just after in a typical composting operation after about the third or fourth day after you make your initial windrow. This is an example of what compost looks like at, at about 60 percent moisture. You can kind of tell that it's, you can see the moisture there and when you give it the squeeze test it bounces back. It just, just doesn't stay firm like that. And this is the Type, this is the percentage moisture that you want to see all the way through the composting process. You might have to add water sometimes. You might have to turn it a few more times if it's too wet. But this is, this is what you want to have. Before you start turning, check the moisture content of the windrow. If you have to choose, err on the wet side. In the arid west, it is always better to take a little excess moisture out by turning than to try and get by with a dry pile. Not enough moisture guarantees failure in this composting business. In fact, if adding moisture is going to be a problem over the course of the compost ma making, start in the spring with feedstocks that are 80% moisture instead of 65. You will prolong the time before you have to add water and come out better in the end. Perhaps you can even make use of some nice fall rains. If you are in a high rainfall area and too much moisture is going to be a limiting factor, try blending your feedstocks into windrows during the dry season. Then add water to them by spreading them out into a two foot high berm during a rainfall. Finish by re-windrowing. Two to three inches of rain will add a lot of moisture to that windrow. You can do it. Just match your situation with ingenuity. Turning windrows by manure spreader and a loader makes use of equipment that is often available on a livestock operation. Our 80 horsepower tractor, spreader, and skid loader can turn about 125 cubic yards of window an hour. You can make a lot of compost using these three pieces of equipment. The same equipment can be used to make your initial windrow and to spread the finished product onto your fields. If you opt for a commercial windrow turner for even greater efficiency, make sure you power it with a hydrostatic drive. A gear drive system is too hard on clutches and the transmission itself. Build your windows five to six feet high. Remember, mass is habitat.
Unless you live in a high rainfall area, at some point you will have to add water to your compost windrow to keep the pro compost process moving along. Here's how we do it using an irrigation system or from a dairy pit that contains low solids effluent, such as from a milking piler and milk house. This home-built sprinkler pipe is a modified 4-inch irrigation pipe. Deflector type nozzles have been added to it. The nozzles are on 10-foot centers. If I had to do it over again, I would make it out of 4-inch wheel line pipe and put the nozzles on 8-foot centers. The wheel line pipe with its inside ribs would make a stronger conduit to support the 8-foot centers. Begin by spreading out your windrow with your skid skier loader so that you have about a 2 or 3 foot high berm. Put your pipe in the center of the berm and pump. As you can see, you can apply a lot of water in a short amount of time. Continue adding water until you have the water coming out of the bottom of the berm. Then add more sections of pipe until you get your whole berm watered. As a general rule, it takes about six to 8,000 gallons of water to do 120 feet of windrow, depending on how dry the windrow is. After watering, push up the berm into a windrow again. It is best if you can immediately turn the windrow with your spreader. This distributes the water evenly through the windrow. In the addition of water, especially during the four or five months curing process, gives compost that deep black dirt aroma and nice texture. Alternatively, you can make a drip system out of a three-quarter inch black poly pipe manifold and tea tape. Simply use a 16 to 18 foot section of black poly pipe and insert your tea tape fitting with the valve every 18 inches along the poly pipe. 50 foot sections of tea tape are about the limit that one can manage. Put plugs in the tea tapes and drape the whole setup lengthwise over the existing windrow. Five gallons a minute of water flow will run this system easily. Turn off each individual tea tape when the water reaches the bottom of the windrow and starts to flow from the compost. The water from the tea tapes at the top of the windrow will take about six hours to penetrate to the bottom. Once one 50 foot section of windrow is wet, Move the drip system successively down the windrow until everything is covered. To mix the water fully into the windrow, turn the windrow. This system works well for a limited number of windrows or parts of a single windrow. It has the advantage of not having to spread out the windrow into a berm. The setup is quick and easy. So let's take a look now. We've got a windrow here that was made uh, four days ago and then three days ago. It's two halves. It's made out of two different feedstocks. The east half was made straight from the corral that had been kind of carefully bedded throughout the lambing season so that we had enough straw there to provide enough straw to manure ratio without mixing it. All we did was clean the corral, put it in the manure spreader here, and windrowed it. The second half was made from those feedstocks that we just talked about, a pile of straw bedding from the lambing barn, and a pile of manure from the lambing barn, and scraping the, the uh, feed alleys um, from the lot. So, there's an interesting thing that happened, and uh, that's one of the things that, that you have to sort of figure out is when things don't go totally according to plan, then how to correct them. And then also how to monitor that so that you know something isn't going the right way for you. Okay, here we are at this windrow again. This windrow was made four days and then another part of it was made three days ago. This windrow is actually probably about 150 feet long and uh, it's about 200 yards of original feedstock material that was combined and made into this windrow. This windrow was about five and a half feet high when it was first made and uh, what we want to show here is the distinct difference, and that's a clue, um, 
between where the first day was made and the second day. Uh, one of the things that we really have to do, as with everything, is monitoring uh, what we're doing. And so, when I came out here the other day, yesterday, looked at this windrow from afar, I, I just kind of immediately noticed this dip right here. You can see it, it's about right here, this height, and then it dips down, and it just continues at that height uh, all the way to the end. And interestingly enough, this part, this lower part of the windrow, was made four days ago with slightly different feedstocks than this part here. That's another clue. So let's go and monitor it a little more scientifically with a thermometer. One of the primary tools that we use to monitor the progress of the compost windrows is a thermometer. This thermometer is specially made for, for uh, testing compost windrows. It's roughly three feet long. You can stick it all the way down into the core of the windrow and it's pretty much indispensable. I think you don't have to know what you're doing scientifically to make compost, but you do need a thermometer. So we're gonna stick this in here. And while it's, it's taking a little bit of time to uh, read, First thing we're going to do, we're looking for answers, is we're going to monitor just kind of by visual, visual means if we got the right C to N ratio or to put it in farmer's terms, the right straw to manure ratio. And as you can see, it looks about right. You know, we got probably about two thirds as much straw as we do manure in here. Let's take another grab of it down deeper. See how much moisture we have. Remember we were doing the squeeze test the other day? So we're squeezing it. Boy, she doesn't, she doesn't spring back at all. There's a lot of moisture in here. And the, the reason is this part of the windrow here was made from directly scooping it out of the feedlot, putting it in the manure spreader, and windrowing it. Whereas the second half over there was made from a pile of straw and a pile of manure. We've had about two inches of rain last week, last year, I mean last week, and this feedlot behind here uh, received all those two inches and it was flat, so we had a lot of moisture uh, put into this, this feedstock material. Whereas over there in those piles, there is only the very top of the pile that got the moisture, so there's quite a bit less moisture in the straw and the manure from those two separate piles than there was in the lot here. So that's, that's something that's different. Let's take a look at our temperature now. This part of the window here has been here four days. And after four days, we should be up to 145 to 150, maybe even 155 degrees. I read the thermometer, it's 110. So that tells me that something isn't quite right here. There's something that uh, is not allowing the uh, microorganisms to proliferate and multiply and consequently we got a little bit of an issue right here. Okay, next let's go up to the other half of the windrow and see what its temperature is. Here we're on the second half of this, uh, this long windrow. This part of the windrow was made three days ago. We've taken two or three, or about three or four different temperature sampling, samples. We got 125, around 130, we are 144 right here at this particular part of the window. This is kind of what I'd expect. Uh, just as an aside, when I pushed this thermometer in on a couple other samples that were 125 and 130, it did not go in as easy as it does right here. So that tells us that it's more fluffy right here and there's more oxygen right here in this part of the window and we're heating up faster. So, uh, you stick it in. Again, we note that it's 140 degrees. Uh, that's going great for us. <clears throat> what we generally do is we wait for it to get to 140 degrees. We wait two days at 140 degrees so it gets nice and cooked in there and then we turn it. Uh, one word of caution, you don't want to uh, 
have this temperature exceed too much above 145 because then it starts killing off all those aerobic bacteria for you. Uh, and it would get to 160 degrees in another three or four days here. So composting is a dedicated pro uh, chain of events. Uh, it's best if you don't make your windrows till you have the time that you can dedicate to turning them on an appropriate fashion. Uh, which is sometimes really difficult on a farm. Uh, and sometimes on our farm that does not get done. It's not the end of the world, however. Uh, we've got some windrows over there on, on the other side of the farm that were made because we had to get the material out of the area, out of the stockpiled area when we were lambing uh, to put more in. And they sat there for about four months before we turned them. And you just start the whole process over again. But it's best if you can dedicate your time for about a month of turning these windrows when they're supposed to be, when they get to about 145 degrees. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got part of this windrow that's not heating up the way it should, and part of it that's going according to plan. One thing I should mention though is, is we always gotta check our manure to straw ratio. And you can see here in my hands that it's very close to that other half. About the same amount, 60, about two thirds per of the, this material here is straw and one third is manure. So we can rule out that our C to N ratio is wrong. Um, what caused that dip? Lack of air, lack of support um, because it was wetter material. So uh, that's what would be my guess is why one is not heating as well as the other one is we got too much moisture in there and that's it's just slumping the windrow more and pushing out that air and so the microbes don't have enough air to to really build their populations and consequently their metabolic products which is heat so uh, so what do we do about it that's the biggest question and what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the windrow we're going to put more air into that windrow and it, since it is a little wetter uh, we'll probably have to turn it two or three times before it gets to the moisture level that we have right here. And so there's, there's always an answer uh, to a problem in this composting business. You just got to kind of figure out what the problem is first and it's pretty easy to do. So what we have here is what well, we start with, straw and manure, or your carbon and your nitrogen, and you're, we're adding air, and we have moisture already in the two feed stalks, and we're mixing them together, and we're piling them, and that is growing our bugs and our protozoa, our bacteria, our fungi. Uh. They're making all that heat for us as they decompose all this carbon and the nitrogen. And this is what we end up here with this side. After five to seven months, we have a beautiful product that is full and teeming with, with fungi, protozoa, bacteria, and a host of other microorganisms. And so one thing that I really want to stress is it's not just the NPK and the other micro minerals and macro minerals that's involved in this compost that we're putting on our fields. It's like a culture. It's got all those bacteria, all that fungi, all that protozoa that we're inoculating our soils with when we're spreading this nice compost on our field. It's like we're accelerating nature a little bit. We're making what nature takes, we're making in about five to seven months what nature takes quite a bit longer to do. So we're adding on to our soils. We're kind of jump starting them when we put this compost on. And that's why I just love to make compost, why I think it's so exciting, is what you start out with, what you end up with, are two entirely different things and very beneficial to your farm. Thanks for being with us today on this little compost video. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me on the Atra Helpline, or you can contact me at daves at ncat.org. Composting is one of my favorite things in life, and uh, we hope that this video has been beneficial to you. Thanks for looking on.